thank you all so much for being here for this program, Voices of the Valley. I um, want to welcome you all to the Missoula Public Library on this beautiful day. Thanks for being here on such a sunny day. Um, I want to start out by recognizing that the Missoula Public Library sits on the ancestral homeland of the Bitterroot Salish and Kalispell peoples. In 1855, the Bitterroot Salish were forced to sign the Hellgate Treaty. Following this treaty, land dispossession and attempts of ethnocide against the Salish and other indigenous tribes were made in efforts to acquire land. Recognizing the colonial past of Montana and upholding indigenous voices helps us to move forward into the future collectively. I also want to say thank you so much to Aspen Decker. Um, we'll have Salish signage uh, in the library very soon, which is here. Um, and the library simply would not be able to do this um, without Aspen's expertise and knowledge. Um, so I just want to thank her and say that we're so grateful for the work she's done um, for the library. Um, I just want to call your attention to a pamphlet that is over there on the table um, and at the merch table over there. I just want to read the back of it um, uh, a little bit. In 2024, MPL will install indigenous culture interpretive exhibits that focus on themes of rivers, the Bitterroot, living with the land, and glacial Lake Missoula. The exhibits feature Salish language translations by Aspen and will be incorporated into a new virtual tour of Missoula Public Library. So that is coming soon, um, all because of, of, of Aspen's work. Um, and then to introduce our speaker, Aspen is an enrolled member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes and a speaker of her tribal language, the Salish language. She graduated from UM in 2021 with a master's degree in linguistics and earned her bachelor's in tribal historic preservation from SKC in 2018. She has a Montana class seven Native American language and culture educator license, and she's been teaching Salish for 10 years. Um, I'm thrilled that she's here with you all to talk about Salish language art um, and the rich history of the Salish and Kootenai tribes. Um, a few other business keeping uh, items. Um, one, we have merchandise to sell in the back. All features this artwork that Aspen did for the library. Um, there's a tote bag. Uh, some t-shirts of various sizes, um, and some postcards, which I'll be back there the whole program and after the program if you'd like to purchase um, those items. All of the proceeds for those items help us bring indigenous art and speakers and programs back into the library, so um, that's really neat. Um, before you leave, uh, there is a survey that you can fill out to tell us what you think of library programs, what you learned, um, what you want to see, um, what you enjoyed. Would appreciate it if you would fill it out, if you have the time. And then lastly, we'll have some, some time at the end of the program for Q&A. So without any further ado, hand it over to Aspen. Good day, everyone. Um, my Suyapi name was Aspen Decker, and my Indian name is Shining Camus Woman. I said I am happy to be here with you all, and thank you for coming today to listen to what I have to talk about. I'll be talking about our Sedlish ways of being uh, and our language and some of my artwork. So thank you again. So an overview, what I'll be discussing is um, Sedlish people and our language. And then an ethno history of um, our Skitkedliuch in this place that we call home, our homelands. Um, and a lot of it will not only tie to sort of the history of this place, but my artwork, because a lot of our ways of being and our language is directly tied to my artwork. It's a lot of where I get my inspiration and my motivation to do my ledger artwork. Um, and then you'll get to see some of my ledger art as well. And I'll be talking about the four signs that we'll have on each of the levels of the library. 
So my our Sedlish language that's here, our dialect is down in the yellow furthest corner. It's called in Sedlishtin. In Sedlishtin, and it means our Sedlish language, something where it comes out of your your lips. So the tin, you'll hear Sedlish tin. Um, and within our Salishan dialect that's um, here in Montana, Idaho, Washington is the Bitterroot Sedlish, the Kalispell, and the Kalispell that are over in Washington, which are also our family. We got split up during the removals and where we had our treaties and our reservations established, and the Spokane language. So there's three tribes within our Salishan dialect, and within the entire Salishan language family, we have 23 different languages. But then there's around like sometimes up to 14 tribes within one dialect. So we have this huge Salishan uh, family. And there's an interior and a coastal Sedlish kind of split. Um, but when I was in linguistics, I was able to kind of like really identify um, our similarities because I never understood it growing up because a lot of times our elders were like, oh, they're from the coast, like they're different. And then they said the same thing about us. Um, but as soon as I got into like breaking down the sentence structures, that's where I found out that, oh, we actually have the same exact positioning of our words and our phrases. Um, it's just that a lot of the nouns are different because of um, kind of adaptation and the ways that our elders saw things. Our language is very descriptive compared to English. And so if you look beyond just the nouns, you could really tell the articulation and positioning of our languages that really correlate. And they all um, you know, have a lot of similarities, especially our interior languages. I could understand like the Colville Okanagan dialect. And there's sometimes just like vowel changes. So for an example, our bitter spectrum, it's one of our staple Sedlish foods that we have here, and it's at the heart of who we are as Sedlish Sedlish. Um, we say spectrum, spectrum, and then the further up towards um, Canada you get, it goes spectrum, spectrum, spookum. So it's really similar where you could um, you know, just hear that slight vowel difference and still understand. Um, uh, there's so much history between each of our Sedlishan uh, language families. There's, you know, its own separate history, but a lot of it is very similar into, um, you know, kind of the things that played out throughout history with assimilation, uh, ethnocide, and um, even with our languages, boarding schools. Um, so yeah, we kind of all have our own regions that we kind of stayed in, but for the most part, our Salishan uh, territories are yellow that you could see. It spreads out Idaho, Washington, Wyoming, down by Yellowstone. But there is times that we went all the way up into Canada and did a lot of trade with like the Okanagan and um, Colville languages that are up there, people. Um, and we have still, you know, that relationship with each other. And for a while, um, it seemed like it kind of um, skipped some generations because of where we were with our reservations. I know a lot of our elders talked about going over and still having that close connection to some of those other Salishan um, bands. But um, we started doing the Salishan Language Conference. And so that was since uh, around 2012 or earlier, 2010. Um, so we've been all pretty closely connected with at least our interior Salishan bands. And a lot of them would actually come down here to Missoula, the ones that were even up in Canada and Nespilam area. They would come over to go get buffalo with us in the plains every season. And I'll keep going with this history because all this artwork is just all going to um, you know, be a part of getting to understand what was here first in Missoula. Because a lot of people see Missoula and Mesula and they think these old buildings like the, um, the MAM, where the Missoula Art Museum is, that was like the oldest library here in Missoula. Um, but when you're looking at the scope and the chronology of how long our Sedlish people have been here, that's just a scratch of the thousands of years and history that we have here in Missoula. 
Um, and even the landscape was a lot different. And I was actually just talking to some people about you know, this windstorm. You know, it was pretty catastrophic. It was different. Like, there's so it's going to be a big part of probably history. You know, everyone probably has a story of seeing a tree fall. You know, um, but a long time ago, we never had all these trees, and so it used to be just this grassland with sagebrush and bitterroot. Um, so yeah, some of our elders and us were talking just about like, if they would have left Missoula alone, they wouldn't have had all these trees blowing around. <laughs> and, uh, so that's a word I want to teach you first. And sedlish is actually where Missoula derived from is our sedlish word. That's our short word. So where I have the tq is um, in parentheses, and that's because we have our short words and our long sedlish words. The short words are kind of like the informal talk. So a lot of times when we're talking, um, our language is a lot slower than English. And it's usually because the vowels are slightly drug on. But if we're, you know, in a, a battle with the Blackfeet or something, um, you know, we can't just sit there and be like, "Hoot and mess, let go," and I'm just dragging on your words. Like it was like, all right, we're gonna have this informal talk where you're able to kind of get through it fast without, um, you know, changing that intonation and the song of the language. So anyway, our short word is where Missoula come from. Masula. In masulet, in masulet, is that full word? And knowing the full words is really integral for understanding the language, because it's the root of what's going on with that word. So the tk, anytime you see that in sedlish, it's talking about water. So this is saying it's the place of the freezing water. So you can make this sign of kind of like a circle or like outwards. In masulet, in masulet. Can you guys all do that with me? In masulet. So it's like freezing. You're kind of grabbing your your arms, and then the sign for water is with your hand. It's like you're cupping that water. Masulet, and that word is as old as Glacial Lake Missoula, and that was during the last ice age. So around over fourteen thousand, if not longer, years. That is um, where that word derived from, and we have oral tradition and coyote stories which my artwork over there, it showcases a lot of our coyote stories and the different characters and animals um, and concepts that you see in our coyote stories. And so we have stories that talk about the Pleistocene air because it's the jumbo animals or those megafauna animals that were bigger. And there's actually been excavation and different um, anthropological work done in different locations where we knew about um, certain stories. And they actually end up finding bones and remains for these jumbo beavers from the story. And so a lot of times, our stories, they are history. They are factual. And a lot of times, our elders will have these stories that are really exaggerated and really funny and interesting because our language, our people, had just an oral tradition. We didn't have a written language until the 80s. And so it had to be passed down through generations, thousands and thousands of years. So you had to make it interesting. Otherwise, who's going to remember how those beavers died over there? <laughs> And now you had to like have a crazy story of how they died, how they became, you know, part of the land over there. So that's how a lot of our stories go: is exaggerating what happened. So a lot of times, even in our language, when we're just telling our stories about hunting or something, it's never to the point like, oh, I went up there and shot this big old elk. It was like, no, tell the story that led up to it. 
And so a lot of times it's using our sign language, our plain sign language, and then really just talking about, oh, the energy, oh, get walking and walking. And you'll mention the walking or hiking or crossing that water all the way until you got up to Mount Jumbo. Pull and to sheds. Got that big elk. And that's actually my plan. So, you know, I got to foresee this because I need to get back up, get up there and hunt our, our elk to get back on our ancestral homeland, you know. Uh, but um, our inmesulet is our older form of a word, and I still use it with my children and within our elders. Um, we still use inmesudla. But then we also have other terms for where it's at on the river here. So our other term is nsa'ai, and that's the place of the small bull trout. Nsa'ai, can you all make that small? Nsa'ai, nsa'ai, ai, ai is our word for bull trout, ai, that full word. And when you add the th, it makes it something small. So again, it has that N at the beginning, which is kind of marking a place name too, and a noun, nsa'ai, place of the small bull trout. And that's not too far from here. It's like, I think, 500 yards away from the library um, is where the confluence of the rattlesnake and the Clark Fork is, and that's where that term um, specifically is nsai. Hmm. And now, in a lot of our Sedlish place names, we have words for every single ridge, every mountain, every stream, pretty much has its own word for what it indicates in that area. And a lot of times it might be derived from a coyote story, from a squidlump or it could be from what we did in that location, what kinds of native plants were there, what kind of harvesting, hunting we did in those locations. So it might have something like it has camas, it has wild plums. So there's things like that that were indicators of what did we do throughout the seasons, where did we go throughout our travels. Uh, and I won't just like read through all the signage because I'll let you all just, you know, at the end or whenever you would like to go and read the signs through. I pretty much just go over um, what Glacier Lake Missoula is and in Mesudlet, the same information I just told you about the place of the freezing water now and how settlers. Uh, modified that word to being Missoula. And a lot of the first settlers that came through here was through the trading post, and it was usually French. The French were the first ones here, and they were here for probably at least like 40 to 60 years before other settlers came through. And so even within our community, there's a lot of um, last names that are French because a lot of the traders kind of came in um, and then they married a native wife or something. So there's a lot of that kind of mixed history of um, also French town, like actually had like this town of French people. Um, and then they would just come over the mountain to trade with us on our res. And um, we also had a few trading posts on our Flathead Indian Reservation. Uh, and then this next one, to live off the land, you know, to kind of, and Hulhuilt is actually my business, our, um, our Hulhuilt LLC is me and my husband's um, business that we started after I got a master's degree in linguistics and kind of did all this language revitalization and cultural um, preservation work we decided to finally start our own business so we could focus on gathering these native plants and focus on the language work that I wanted to focus on, as well as teaching people about who we are, Sedlish people, and our history here in this land. Um, but we chose this word, to be alive and well, because that term, that concept goes beyond just living or alive. Like there's this meaning of like kind of air and just like who we are. It's sort of this connection to all living things because it could all be 
alive. And um, in our language, we don't really specify whether an object is inanimate or um, animate. <laughs> I forgot the term for a second. But um, like the rocks and everything, anytime we're talking about it, we use the same S for he, she, or it. So it didn't matter about gender or um, what the object was, you used the same term because in our, our ways of being, our values is that everything has a purpose. Everything is a living being and we have that reciprocity and we give back as much as we take. So it all kind of goes along with that term. <laughs> And so for this signage, um, I was talking to uh, Slavin about um, like the, the elk and kind of these different lines that we could see from Glacial Lake Missoula. And so when we were um, discussing, you know, what kind of signage do we want here? And what do we want to tell? This library is a beautiful place because you could see you know, all of Missoula up here and you could see kind of these different geographic things that, that are, um, you know, throughout Missoula. So the one that we wanted to focus on was also the elk because I think it's the third floor that you guys have the scope looking at the elk. Eh? <laughs> and I think that's the third floor, but um, you could see up to Mount Jumbo and these herds. And so what do those elk herds and a lot of these big game herds mean for Sadlish people? And so looking at that and thinking about it, there's so much that goes into our hunting and our communal hunting as a tribe. And so this signage with the Khutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutkhutk
even this landscape, you know, it, it's been established. There's no longer a lot of our bitter digging sites throughout Missoula because there's concrete, it covered it up. So our land, all these animals, they fill this too. And so it's our responsibility to respect them. And I think there's been a big shift for a lot of people that are trying to bring back more native plants and using that in their gardens instead of um, you know, all these non-native invasive species. <coughs> Sorry, I get all emotional about this stuff. <laughs> um, but anyway, this um, Stutli Juan, it also talks about our fire knowledge. So along with respecting the land, sometimes um, I think a lot of people and scholars think that if you just leave the land alone, that's the best for it. But a lot of times it's that it needs its augmentation from us in a respectful manner that's going to benefit everything in our ecosystem. And so that's some of our philosophy within our, our tribe and within my family is how do we help the spike and help these different native plants that we harvest often. And one of our traditional ways was fire. Through fire knowledge, we were able to augment the earth and clean it out when it needed it because when you get these big trees and all this brush, a lot of other things aren't able to grow. And so burning it, and having somebody who it's their job to keep track of the land. So um, I don't know if a lot of you have seen um, our pictographic winter counts on hides. It not only talks about like the history that happened within that six months or a year, there was other things that they were keeping track of. So one of them was like the fire knowledge of knowing this whole area was burnt five years ago, 10 years ago. They knew when it was time after so many years to go back and um, light it up. And a lot of, um, like even California, they're starting to look at more indigenous knowledge because it's, you know, it's ridiculous just how much um, our forest fires are taking over and it's hard to manage. But if we would do it the indigenous way, you burn out all that old brush and our elders say through the ashes comes new life new growth and so all these plants start growing and it's just this whole ecosystem and then we know when we come back the following year these elk these big game animals they're going to be there and so burning could help prevent some of these forest fires even though a lot of us get scared like it's going to burn all these houses or whatever it might be um, you know there's a lot kind of in the way now it's not like it used to be where it was just open filled um, so, you know, it's just the way that we do it. And there are ways where we could burn in a respectful manner to the land and to everyone who's now living here. Um, anyway, I could go on and on about our fire knowledge. And there's actually a lot of indigenous um, scholars that have papers, and one of them is my cousin. So if you um, just research this, um, you could really look into the different um, indigenous burning that happened traditionally and that we somewhat try to keep going today. Like within my tribe, we have a whole program, a department that focuses on, you know, keeping our, our land clean and having its um, burns every year. Oh, no. <laughs> Spectrum, bitterroot. So that word I showed you earlier, if you make this sign upwards, this is for like the flower of the bitterroot. And so bitterroot is actually our Montana state flower. So now, and so when anytime you make this sign, it's for any flower. So um, we always use sign language and then you specify with the word. But spectrum, if you also flip it downwards, this is how you could tell it's specified to bitterroot. And then you clean your fingers because we clean the roots. So spectrum. Is to clean those roots. Spectrum is the biggest part of our sedlish seasonal round, I would say. I mean, we have a lot of different native plants like camas and different things that we harvested and, um, you know, had a whole protocol to how, um, like, our songs, our ceremonies. But our bitterroot, a lot of our people, our, our elders, they talk about the heart of the bitterroot is the heart of the sedlish people. And there's actually a little heart in the bitterroot. Did you guys know that? 
So right where its little body, it kind of looks like it has legs and arms and all that. In the body, there's a little heart. When you tear it open, it's a little red spouse. And so out of respect, we always take that spouse out and rebury it. Um, and so that's where that saying comes from, the spectrum spouse. And we have a whole story to the bitter root of how it came to be um, through these bitter, bitter tears. And we have all this oral tradition that will really tell about who we are and how things came to be for us. But I can't tell them because it's not winter time. <laughs> so around mid-November, that's where you could hear me telling these coyote stories and how the bitter root came to be now but as far as the spectrum in this area um, like I already said this whole Missoula Valley was grassland we had cottonwood trees and some trees kind of like near the river and on the mountains but for the most part it was a grassland and there was a lot of prickly paired cactus too and when you go kind of further towards like Butte, you could kind of still see some of the, that similar landscape. And I feel like even Helena kind of has that older Missoula look where there's not nearly as many trees. Um, but this, that prickly paired cactus is actually really beneficial for the bitterroot because bitterroot ends up curling up and rolling underneath these different bushes and then they drop their seeds. And so that's where we find it a lot of the times. So it's really interesting when you start to look into the life of those, ani those animals, those plants, because there's so much going on in our ecosystems. And the more that we learn about it and the language our in that goes along with these different processes and respect for those plants, you could really get that deep understanding of our relationship with them. And so the spectrum, it grew throughout our entire Missoula Valley. We had different spots throughout Missoula. Sometimes it was near like Fort Missoula area where the old uh, shop co is. I forgot what the new store is there. <laughs> but that whole area was a campsite with a ton of bitterroot all the way over to like um, Coles. And like that whole area was another site. And then here by the university. Um, and actually, I'm going to get to one of my art pieces that I did about the Missoula Sedlish Island that used to be where Karis Park is. And it used to um, be detached from the land. But then after, it was like around the early 1900s, they, um, they, I guess, made it a part of the land. So they took out that river going around it. And um, that, that land, that island there, actually used to be one of our biggest um, campsites that we were at every year. And the reason why Missoula is our Beirut Sedlish um, homeland, it was the place that our elders and our kids, the ones that couldn't travel, stayed at year round. And so those elders, they were just there on that island, and I made a piece about it. <laughs> And I actually have another piece, too, that I'll share that, um, and a story about my kache, my great auntie and grandma, and how they used to dig bitterroot over by the fairgrounds. And I'm actually in the middle of working on a piece about um, that area and the bitterroot that they were digging when they were kids. And that my auntie's still alive. Like, it's not a removed history. I think a lot of people think, like, that's just a long time ago. It's like in the past, like, get over, you know, some of these historical traumas. But there are grandparents that are the ones that are still here. So, um, you know, Missoula is drastically changing. And I think I'm preaching to the choir because I'm sure a lot of you who have been here in Missoula, like, know the changes that you've seen. Even just in the last few years, there's so much development been near, like, reserve. And it's crazy just to see. Sometimes even um, sad about like, how much is getting lost because we didn't do enough excavation to see what's in those sites. Because where the crackle barrel is, there was all these uh, teepee rings. And I was wanting to get out there to go look and find it. And I heard there was a lot of like um, arrowheads and different artifacts found out there, our belongings. And now it's just you know covered in development. So who knows you know, what's kind of being lost. Oh, no. But this one, the spectrum. Did I go over this? Sorry. <laughs> I better um, at least mention a little more about my intuit. The river is important. And as I've been talking about the seasonal round and the place names, we have names throughout the entire river. 
And so I already kind of shared the inside them. So I'll let you read this one after two and um, just learning about that inside them. And I encourage you to go walk around out in you know what we have left of this natural world by the river, seeing where that confluence is and building that um, that respect because it's for all of us. This area we're in now. It's up to us to have that respect and relationship with the land and the only way we're going to continue to preserve and have restoration efforts in this area is if we work together. So I think being in those locations helps us to feel that sense of care and love for these, these waterways and our, our different native plants. And this, this um, artwork that I did here, um, I guess I'll start with like what ledger art is because I'm not sure if you all are familiar with what it is. Um, a lot of it began um, as soon as paper and a lot of these newer materials were introduced to indigenous peoples. But before that, it's kind of like the oldest indigenous art that came from like cave paintings, petroglyphs, um, and then it moved you know, onto hides. We have all these pictographs that um, indicate very important information of history or um, like some kind of warfare or uh, hunting event that happened. And so a lot of that gets showcased on hides. And this, this aesthetic of no faces, you see how they have no eyes, like no noses? It's because a lot of times in our indigenous um, artwork, it's not about the faces like we see in European art, where it's like your identity is your face. You know, we could tell who exactly it is by the portrait that was painted. But for us, identity goes beyond that. It's about who is your people, who is your family based on your regalia, on your designs. And so that's why the faces aren't important. But when you look at all the details that I add, um, you could tell who they are sometimes by the family designs or whether they're Sedlish or Crow or Blackfeet. And sometimes we have a lot of mixes. So my tribe, we have a lot of mixing with Nez Perce, Crow, Blackfeet, all these kind of like neighboring tribes and vice versa. We did a lot of like trade um, marriages. And so sometimes you see that overlap. Um, and then you could see on this piece too, there's a claw up there, there's a grizzly bear in an older ledger art from the 1800s, which is where I get a lot of inspiration from um, the elders, or not the elders, the chiefs that actually went to like Fort Merriam and to like kind of a, essentially a prison for these chiefs where they tried to educate them in a way thinking that if they go back to their people, they're going to share what they've learned. And since they're the leaders of those people, they thought that was the best way to assimilate them. And that was actually the way that um, they decided to structure boarding schools for children. So essentially the same way as a prison. And so that's where, um, well, it's a place called the, um, the first boarding school for, not Fort Marion. Um, Carlisle, yeah, the guy, the one, um, vampire guy off of that one. That's always remember Carlisle, but Carlisle Indian School. Um, you know that was the very first one of many, and then they popped up throughout all of Indian country, near you know every reservation, and a lot of children were sent further so that way they couldn't just run back home. Anyway, I won't get too into that history, um, but a lot of my work you'll see. Um, kind of beautiful where you can't tell sort of the hardship that's going on. And so for this piece, it's the Bitterroot Sedlish removal from our homeland. <clears throat> and so after the 1855 Hellgate Treaty, we were forced to be removed from our homeland onto a reservation. And that was the same for a lot of indigenous peoples. They had to get removed and pushed somewhere or together with another tribe. And so this depicts the old bridge, the Grizzly, ba Grizzly Bear Tracks Bridge. Um, and this was, I believe, in 1889, when we finally were removed officially from the Bitterroot Sedlish land near Hamilton and Stevensville. Um, and like I was saying, I try to keep it somewhat beautiful. So that way you could see sort of like our resilience and um, 
you know, who we are. Even though we were moving, our elders were always dressed to impress. They're always beautiful. All of our stories talk about them just being decked out on their horseback. Anytime they were even just picking berries or whatever it might be. So even though we were being removed, we had all of our, our regalia, all of our belongings, our horses at that time, and then the bitter root up above just represents, you know, our bitter root and how important it is to us, as well as the homeland that we were being removed from and how we're not just going to be able to go back and harvest anymore, as well as the little insaichdom. What was insai? Anybody remember? Yep, the bull trout, the bottom. I try to add a lot of sedlish language throughout my artwork. So at the top it says, When we left the Bitterroot um, land. That's what it means, kind of being removed. And this um, map is actually done on an 1855 map. So, or no, 1879. It's like in my... Um, <laughs> It's down where the bridge is, so it's kind of hard to see the date. But a lot of the work that I do is on older either maps or ledger paper. And I feel like because it tells the history and the stories that our ancestors from that time didn't get to share, because we didn't get to talk our language or even practice culture, I wouldn't be able to be wearing this regalia up until 1878 Native American Religious Freedom Act but finally allowing us to practice culture, talk our language openly. And um, that's actually how powwows even came to be, was we said, oh yeah, we're just celebrating your 4th of July or your Columbus Day or Labor Day, but it was actually a way that we could come together and dance and practice culture. So a lot of it had to be you know, kind of hidden. And so for me, using these older documents and this concept of a map, for who, for who, whose map is this? Because it's not relevant to us and the way that we see our place names. So I like to just you know, paste all my, um, my artwork over even things that you think are the important information on a map and sometimes churning the map or whatever it might be or using it to show where we were at so you could see the reservation and I have the red line that marks our removal and it's right where that Hellgate um, where the Hellgate is. So I thought that this map was perfect for kind of this layout. Ooh, no. And then this is my other piece that I did about that island that I mentioned earlier. So where Karis Park was, it split. And I think this was also a form of protection because we had a lot of, you know, like our enemies sometimes coming through. We had scouts up on mountains. Um, it was this like whole thing where um, we had a very complex society, even though it seems like we were just maybe out, you know, gathering and having a good old time. Like there was a very complex society and the ways that we interact with neighboring tribes as well. And so instead of just doing the typical um, kind of camp scene, I decided to do our stick game. And so playing stick game in, a, in the old way with like the poles is a way of showcasing just how vibrant our culture is and our language. And that game, it was played so long ago that there was actually mammoth bones, like the tusks of stick game bones found. So that shows how old that game is. It's back thousands of years and we still play it today. And now and you can see this bitter digger over on the edge and kind of like how Missoula used to be with the sagebrush. And this one is um, a piece that I recently did just um, well, like three weeks or a month ago. And it's about the um, Hellgate Treaty signing. And so for this map, I thought it was great to use because it was the Indian reservation maps of 1884 and so it was right after like all of these big treaties were passed and official tribes um, you know had their reservations and official recognition and so they created this map showing all the reservations and kind of like these red bulks throughout the United States and so um, having this scene of our 18 tribal leaders, chiefs who signed our Hellgate Treaty is important information to know about because it's like, who are these people and why were they important for us? So a lot of their Indian names I have at the top 
one's like big canoe, plenty horses, chief plenty horses was chief Charlotte who um, signed the Hellgate Treaty and that's my kids' great, great, great grandfather. And then it has my great grandfather, great, great, great grandfather, it's like three grades back, um, Grizzly Bear Tracks. So where the name of Grizzly Bear Tracks is actually um, my grandfather, his oldest daughter was my great, great grandmother. So, um, you know, a lot of these leaders, I try to depict their Indian names because that usually shows how did you get that? How did you, um, you know, complete something important throughout your life where you got to use that name and how it gets passed on to your family? And so the next one I'm going to be doing is um, one about the, the women because I like to focus on indigenous women and you know their role because our society wasn't just um, patriarchal. We had a very mixed matriarchal and patriarchal society where our women were also the chiefs and they were actually present here, but they didn't get to sign the Hellgate Treaty. So I'll be doing one about them soon. <laughs> um, uh, and then this one, I have just like a few more pieces. I pretty much go on and on about all this history all day, but just to be kind of quick that that church is, do you know what church it is? Can anybody recognize? Yep, St. Ignatius Church. And so following that history, the chronology of our coyote stories, this piece over here, all the way through contact, and then the Hellgate Treaty signing, the removal, following that came this church and the missions, the boarding schools that were on each side of this church. And a lot of my artwork and my public speaking that I do, I like to, um, you know, share our indigenous perspective of what really happened. Because when you look at a lot of the published content that is there, it's usually from like the black robes, the Jesuits who came through. And it's not really the story about what, how we experienced it. And so in some of the history that I've read, it said that the Salish people decided to move closer to the mission church because they were you know so happy to be near it and so they like decided to move like it was a peaceful move instead of saying this was a removal and the implications of what the church and the um, boarding schools did for our people and I mean, in a very negative way, um, you know, it needs to be shared because the only way that we're going to be able to reconciliate and move past this um, is if we acknowledge what truly happened and these terms that need to be said. And so I depicted this church because in front of it, there's actually um, our tribe did a kind of excavation on that field and there was around 270 remains of uh, children from the boarding school and you know a lot of them were murdered and that's where the missing murdered indigenous peoples and the every child matters movement these are current issues and issues that have happened since contact and so um, you know making sure that this artwork is also um, sharing what really happened and where things are because people see that church as being beautiful but I kind of see it as being a hard place to be around because I know what happened there and um, even in the basement of this church of just, you know, the horrific things that happened um, with the furnace, you know, all those kinds of things. It's like I don't get a good feeling when I'm there um, and it's not just, you know, being against anybody's beliefs, but it's more of like the things that happened and kind of being haunted in a way. Um, but it needs to be acknowledged and a lot of those teepees that I have out here, there were parents that would go and set up TP just to be close to their kids, even though they couldn't even talk to them. Um, and anyway, you could do your research on boarding school and um, kind of you know learn about the hard history there. And I actually put in a few people that I saw from old black and white photos. And one of them is my friend's um, great grandfather or grandfather with the um, he has like that pa the um, headdress with the horns. Um, so it actually came from like an old black and white photo with that church in it. And so I like to use these older photographs and telling the story of who was there and, you know, what was going on. Um, there's a lot that I could talk about, but I did want that church to look very, um, you know, close to the way that it actually is. And so I spent pretty much all day just getting the shading done 
and adding in all the details. And I recently was up there because um, we have our dentist, our dental and tribal health right next to that church. So I drove by it and I was like, wow, like just doing the artwork, I like figured out all the little detail and architecture of this church. Um, but anyway, there's a lot of history there. And right next to that, the lady on the horse, you could actually go over to the Missoula Art Museum and it's still up, I think for another month maybe. And I did that on 18 sheets of 1855 um, or 1876 antique ledger paper. And I wrote out all these names of missing, murdered indigenous peoples. And it took me around six to seven hours to sit there and write out their names, their ages, and where they were from. And then some of the MMIW statistics that you could see like at the corner. Um, and so this is actually a really big piece, and I encourage you to go check it out because I think it's a very powerful piece. And like I said, it's kind of this um, contemporary and old issue that we've been dealing with. Um, and it says, look for our indigenous women. And then the top one, it's just like a really rough draft of one of my digital files, because um, that's the one I'm working on right now on a Montana map. And it'll be in the open air um, auction coming up. And it has um, the Missoula Fairgrounds, the rodeo, because their um, theme is like the fair. So I wanted to depict that fair with the horse riding. And we actually had some of um, some people from our res that actually rode horses in some of those races. So it's interesting, like kind of that, um, that bridge between kind of what was going on and my grandma and great auntie, they were out there when they were around eight years old, digging bitter right there in that field of the, um, the fairgrounds. And so that was a big harvesting site for a long time. And Sophie Mui's, which is a lot, a lot of those older photographs that you might find of flathead women is actually this, um, Sophie Moise digging bitterroot and stuff. And so they were out there with her. And she was um, one of the ones that like my family kept an eye on was like helping her throughout the last of her days. But um, I wanted to show that that like this fair <laughs> is not just, you know, what we experience with the rides and things that happen is like what goes beyond that in that area and that land. And at the same time, you know, we're still digging bitterroot and having that relationship with that area. And so for today, like nowadays, I try to go out there, even if the land's different now, like I bring my kids out there and they ride their bikes around that area. And I haven't seen any bitterroot, but it'd be great if we could start planting it. And I actually just helped them with some signage in the new native plant garden, which is right there on the fairground. So go check it out. I'm really happy that they're bringing those plants back. And here's just another one with buffalo. And um, I try to focus a lot on even our older stories about the buffalo and how we help to um, save them, essentially, because there was a time where the buffalo were nearly wiped out. And we had a, one of our ancestors called Atatitze. He was falcon robe. He had this vision to go bring back these uh, bison calves to um, domesticate them and help to save them. And so the elders, the committees, kind of um, like our different chiefs, they said no to that because they said the buffalo were, weren't meant to be domesticated. That's their home. Um, but then it wasn't until his son, Satatitsa, that he brought back seven buffalo calves. And those buffalo calves saved the buffalo for the most part and especially for like the bison range those buffalo come from that herd from those herd of seven little buffalo calves bison calves um, it grew into this huge herd and before our allotment and everything like opened up on the reservation we had an open range where these buffalo were roaming we had wild horses and we were able to kind of live the same way we have always lived until um, it was opened up to white settlers and um, having our own individual home sites. So anyway, this kind of story, there's different um, indications of you know, our stories that I could tell through this artwork, as well as kind of our traditional artwork. And some of it's more contemporary because beads didn't come until later. But we had beads from um, like different berries and quill work. And so I try to also keep like par flesh and our horns and different kinds of um, belongings going and making sure that we 
still remember how to do it traditionally, and we could have these adaptations. But lam lam shpesia, thank you all um, for coming, and I'll open it up to Q&A. <laughs> We have a couple of minutes for questions, so I'll walk the mic around if anybody has any. Because of the forced assimilation and like lost language in some ways, um, what's it like right now, I guess, on trying to bring that language back to the people who you know originally would speak the language? You know, I'm just kind of curious. Like, is there a push, you know, or like, or anything you can speak on, you know, about trying to bring this language back? Yeah, definitely. My family was very culturally oriented, and I had a lot of language growing up just from um, being around ceremony and hearing kind of the prayers of it. So by the time I learned, I was 13, and I already had sort of the articulation, the flow of the language. So I think that really helped me to pick up on it a lot quicker. And my teacher, he always used sign language anytime he was talking. So that helped to make sense of anything I didn't know. He like used the sign and I'm like, oh, he's talking about this in his story. So it helped me to get fluent within just a few months. Um, and then that's pretty much been my path ever since. And there's other people like that where like at some point in their life, they got that inspiration to be like, I need to focus on language work. Um, and that's how that language school got started. Um, and then with my own personal story is I knew that as soon as I had kids, I needed to talk language to them because our elders always talk about, like, it starts with the home. It starts with talking to your own kids. And so I knew from the time I was, like, 13 that, like, when you have kids someday, you need to talk language to them. And so that's what I did. And I, I have a lot more hope for the language than I ever have because I know that no matter what, our language is safe and secure because we now have children speakers that, in the, you know, that's going to be 80 years of, our language being okay. And eventually when I have grandkids, I'm gonna to speak to them as well. Um, but you know, it's, it's definitely a hard, um, a hard thing that happened because our elders, there's a lot of them that are called language rememberers. And there hasn't really been too much um, study on that. But what I looked into when I was in linguistics was that through trauma, sometimes people are silent. And I think that's what happened with those ones that know, know everything in the language, but they just can't spit it out. It's because of the trauma they experienced in boarding school. And so I think a lot of our elders, I hope that they eventually get to the point of healing before you know it's too late, because I want them to be able to share what they know. And I think a lot of our elders are sharing these things with their family. And I lost my one um, elder that taught me everything I knew a few years ago. And when I was sad thinking that those stories, some of those stories weren't recorded or there, um, there ended up being you know, all these people in the community that are like, I remember the time you told me this story. So I think within everybody um, in your community or family, like they have the stories that put the puzzle together. So I feel like no matter what, our language is never gonna just die. It might be sleeping, but you could bring it back. And so there's a lot of indigenous tribes that are in that position where their language, they, they call it dormant or sleeping, but they could bring it back. And I believe in that because our language is a living being. Um, so as long as we try our best, and continue to try to build these um, different language learning content, teaching people, I think we're gonna have you know success in that because we've always been resilient. We still have our culture and language and we're still thriving on our, our homelands. No. Maybe one more question, if there is one. Hello. Um, thank you for the great presentation. My question is regarding the um, ledger paper. Is that uh, something that you have to search and find and buy and, and keep close? Or do, do people use copies of certain old documents? And how is the ledger paper um, accumulated? Thank you. Yeah, I usually have to like search it. And sometimes it's through auctions or through just meeting other people that know about documents. I only use authentic documents. And um, like there's been a few times I was public speaking and somebody's like, hey, I know of this like entire ledger book that we have um, that's like an old, um, what was it, like the trains, like 
um, it was one of their ledger books. And so she gave me like a whole big like thing of it. It's probably like 20 pe sheets of it. Sheets of paper, sorry. <laughs> I was trying to think of like the term for um, what they use for their railroads. But um, yeah, they gave me that. And then there was another person that ended up giving me a map. And then a lot of times I just end up looking and searching through different auctions. So yeah, it's out there. I think there's quite a bit out there. But um, sometimes um, there's maps that are really like unique that it's hard to find them. So as soon as I, you know, find the ones that I like, I especially like the ones that are before 1880s, they say Sedlish for Flathead Lake. And those are my like favorite maps to find. <laughs> so yeah, you could find it online. Eh. Well, I want to be respectful yeah. of Aspen's time. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you all for coming. Uh,